I was at Agenda 2000, and uh, one of the people who was there was Craig Mundy, who is some kind of high mucky muck at Microsoft. I think uh, Vice President of Consumer Products or something like that. And uh, I hadn't actually met him. I, I, I uh, bumped into him in an, at an elevator, in an elevator. And uh, I looked at his badge and said, ah, I see you work for Microsoft. And he looked back at me and said, oh, yeah, and what do you do? And I thought he seemed just a, a, sort of a tad dismissive. I mean, here's the archetypal you know, guy in a suit looking at a scruffy hacker. And so I gave him the thousand-yard stare and said, I'm your worst nightmare. For most of its short but colorful history, the computer industry has been dominated by the Windows operating system. But that could soon change, as Windows faces a strong challenge from Linux. Silicon Valley has long been the place to develop new technology, start new companies, and get really rich. Now the Valley is the front line in a revolution fighting for that most politically incorrect of ideas, individual freedom. Day and night, a loose confederation of hackers and programmers zaps bits and pieces of computer code around the world as it builds the tools to set computer users free. Using open information and the free exchange of technology to achieve its goals, this revolution began in the 1980s with the free software movement and the GNU project, and now is most commonly associated with Linux and the open source movement. We do have one sector that is taking off today. It is the Linux-related sector. And I thought this might be a good opportunity to say, what is Linux? And I'll uh, answer this question for you. Many of you probably already know, but there are 12 million users out there. A computer operating system developed by hundreds of programmers collaborating on the internet. A challenge to Microsoft Windows NT. Very popular for its speed. And so this is what the craze is about. To kind of explain what Linux is, you have to explain what an operating system is. And the thing about an operating system is that you, I mean, you're not, never ever supposed to see it because nobody really uses an operating system. People use programs uh -huh. on their computer. And the only mission in life of an operating system is to help those programs run. So an operating system never does anything on its own. It's only waiting for the programs to ask for certain resources or, or s ask for a certain file on the, on the disk or ask for the programs to connect them to the outside world. And then the operating system comes, steps in and, and tries to make it easy for people to write programs. Open source is a way for people to collaborate on software without being encumbered by all of the problems of intellectual property, having to negotiate contracts every time you buy a piece of software, have a lot of lawyers involved. In general, we just want to get the software to work, and we want to be able to have people contribute fixes to that, etc. So we sort of sacrifice some of the intellectual property rights and just let the whole world use the software. Before there could be Linux, there was Richard Stallman and the free software movement. I mean, think of Richard Stallman as the great philosopher, right? And think of me as the engineer. Richard Stallman is the founding father of the free software movement. Through his efforts to build the GNU operating system, he created the legal, philosophical, and technological foundation for the free software movement. Without these contributions, it's unlikely that Linux and open source would have evolved into their current forms today. I joined the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab in 1971. I joined a thriving community of hackers people who loved programming, loved exploring what they could do with computers, and they had developed a complete operating system, entirely written there, and I became one of the team that continued to improve the operating system, adding new capabilities. That was my job, and I loved it. We all loved it. That's why we were doing it. And <clears throat> we called our system the incompatible time-sharing system, which is an example of the playful spirit which defines a hacker. Hackers are people who enjoy playful cleverness. 
Well, it first started going wrong as the outside world started pressuring us to have passwords. We didn't have any passwords on our computer. And the reason was that the hackers who'd originally designed the system realized that passwords were a way that the administrators could control all the users. And they didn't want to build tools, you know, locks and keys for the administrators to control them. So they just didn't do it. They left that out. And we had the philosophy that whoever is sitting at the computer should be able to do whatever he wants and somebody else who was there yesterday shouldn't be controlling what you do today. When they put passwords onto one of the machines at MIT, I and a bunch of other hackers didn't like it. I decided to try a subversive sort of hack. <clears throat> I figured out how to decode the passwords, so by looking at the database of encoded passwords, I could figure out what each person would actually type to log in. And so I sent messages to people saying, hello, I see that you've chosen the password mumble, or whatever it was. How about if you do as I do, just type enter for your password. It's much shorter, much easier to type. And of course, with this message, I was implicitly telling them that the security was really just a joke anyway. But in addition, I was letting them in on this hack. And eventually, a fifth of all the users on that computer joined me in using just enter as their passwords. Where did the ideas that led to what is now called open source, where, how did that begin? Who, who began that? Well, it actually began with the start of computers, because at that time, software was just passed around between people. And I think it was only like in the late 70s, early 80s, people started really closing up their software and saying, no, you can never get a look at the source code. You can't change this software, even if it's necessary for you to fix it for your own application. And um, you can actually blame some of that on Microsoft. They were one of the real pioneers of the proprietary software model. In the mid-1970s, a group of hackers and computer hobbyists in Silicon Valley formed the Homebrew Computer Club. In the club's January 31st, 1976 newsletter, Bill Gates of the recently formed Microsoft wrote an open letter to the community where he made a point-by-point -point argument for the relatively new concept of proprietary software. Up to that point, the practice of computer users had been to freely pass around software with not much thought given to its ownership. Known as an open letter to hobbyists, Bill Gates writes, to me, the most critical thing in the hobby market right now is the lack of good software courses, books, and software itself. Without good software and an owner who understands programming, a hobby computer is wasted. Will quality software be written for the hobby market? Gates goes on to write, The feedback we have gotten from the hundreds of people who say they are using BASIC has all been positive. Two surprising things are apparent, however. One, most of these users never bought BASIC, and two, the amount of royalties we have received from sales to hobbyists makes the time spent on Altair BASIC worth less than $2 an hour. Why is this? As the majority of hobbyists must be aware, most of you steal your software. Hardware must be paid for, but software is something to share. Who cares if the people who worked on it get paid? Is this fair? One thing you don't do by stealing software is get back at MITS for some problem you may have had. MITS doesn't make money selling software. One thing you do do is prevent good software from being written. Who can afford to do professional work for nothing? What hobbyist can put three-man years into programming, finding all bugs, documenting his product, and distribute it for free? The fact is, no one besides us has invested a lot of money in hobby software. What about the guys who resell Altair Basic? Aren't they making money on hobby software? Yes, but those who have been reported to us may lose in the end. They are the ones who give hobbyists a bad name and should be kicked out of any club meeting they show up at. I would appreciate letters from anyone who wants to pay up or has a suggestion or comment. Signed, Bill Gates, General Partner, Microsoft.